Uh, okay, folks, let's start. Uh, welcome to that seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Ratul Mahajan. Uh, Ratul is a senior researcher at Microsoft Research, and he also is an affiliate professor at Washington University. Uh, today, University, University of Washington. University of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and today's talk is going to be about uh, software-defined networks and um, uh, how you can update systems more efficiently uh, and with better uh, verification and value properties. <coughs> Previous work and current work includes smart home networks, internet routing, measurements, and now verification and uh, software-defined networks. So, thanks for coming. Thank you. By the way, at the outside I show, this talk is a birthday gift for Yanis. It's like uh, <laughs> it's a birthday today, so I decided to come down and talk here. Uh, just for him. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, by the way, like Yanis said, uh, Ratul Mahajan, I work at Microsoft Research uh, over in Redmond, not the campus close to you guys. And what I'm going to talk about is I work with a lot of collaborators, both within and outside of Microsoft. Outside of Microsoft is mostly the four students who've uh, done a lot of the heavy lifting on the project and the bottom line is uh, collaborators who live in the real world. Um, okay, so so basically I think it might seem like, so let me tell, maybe start off in the following way. I think um, I didn't mean to do research in software defined networking. I was a rather late convert to it. We were, but then um, we hit upon a problem in Microsoft's networks and SDN seemed like the right way to solve the problem and since then we realized a lot of issues about SDNs, where promises are, where the gap between the promise and reality is. And this talk is about that kind of a journey, in the sense of what we did, what we tried to do, what problems we faced, and how we actually tried to solve them. Yeah. So here was the problem. The problem is that large, essentially, cloud computing <coughs> providers like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, we run a lot of data centers that are globally distributed. These data centers are connected using pipes that run up to hundreds of gigabits per second to terabits of seconds. They go across continents, they go across oceans. As a result of which, these networks are really, really expensive. Not only are they expensive, they're also a highly critical resource for us. They're critical for the performance of our services, they're critical for the reliability of our services. So every write, for instance, that the user does to Miami gets mirrored to two or three other data centers depending on the SLA work now. So we rely on it, this, and there's a lot of traffic essentially flowing across it. So basically, the amortized cost of such a network runs easily into hundreds of millions of dollars annually. So while this network is really expensive and really important, the problem was that current technology stack, as it exists today using MPLS, but don't mind the buzzwords if you're not aware of it, uh, the current technology stack, the way this network is operated today, is highly, highly inefficient. By highly inefficient, I mean not just sev not 70% or whatnot, even the busiest of links are essentially used only 30 to 50% in this network. So we are basically <coughs> using a lot of money on the table, building this network up and not being able to use it. And the reason we are not able to use it is basically twofold. One is that there's a lack of coordination amongst services that use the network. So think of a service as an application running on multiple servers sending traffic into the network. So this could be your application, this could be searching like a Bing query, or it could be those Azure writes, uh, as an example. So these services, they send traffic on this network whenever they want, however much they want. The result is that, so this is a day-long trace taken on one of the links in the network, one of the busy links in the network, and what you see is like, you go through these periods of peaks and valleys. And because people are doing, services are doing what they want to do. 
Now you might say, and you know, the network is not provisioned, like we don't, we don't really over provision this network because it's really expensive. So the network is basically provisioned to carry peak capacity and that's essentially the reasoning operators are running through their head when they provision these things. But the result of that is that the peak to mean ratio is essentially over two. So that means the average utilization of this link is well under 50%. So there are two views of the problem. One view is that, what can you do? You have this capacity, you have to carry peak traffic. And this is the best you can do. But that's not true. It's not true because if you look closer into the traffic this network carries, some of it is background traffic. So basically large jobs, think of map reduce cost most jobs. We have entire clusters and there's petabytes of transfers that need to be done from one data center to the other. So that's kind of one example of background traffic. And there's a lot of non-background traffic as well. Some of it is interactive, some of it has SLAs to the order of few minutes and so forth. <coughs> so if you look at this pattern, and you realize that essentially that the background traffic can be adapted. And if you adapt in this case by pushing background traffic and letting it eat only the capacity that is left over by the non-background traffic, what you can do is flatten this thing. The flattening thing basically would lead to a 50% reduction in peak, and you can use the capacity to either provision, uh, carry more traffic, or you could essentially cut down your uh, optical cost by a factor of two or so, and, and so forth. So depending on what you want, basically the re end result is uh, better use of the network. Uh, another reason for inefficiency is that the networks as they run today, they make local and greedy uh, decisions around how resources are used and how flows are routed. So take one particular example, let's say, and, and the algorithm they run is very simple. If A wants to send traffic to E, what it would do is do this constraint shortest path routing. So it finds a path in the network that has the capacity to carry the amount of flow it needs to send. So this is basically the logic behind MPLS. And in this case, you know, if C wants to then send traffic to D because this link CD is taken, it essentially takes a longer path. And then if C wants to send traffic to G, it takes a much longer path. And this is not a theoretical problem. We've actually observed this problem in our networks, and there's a paper that documents how bad it is and whatnot. So MPLS, as it's making these greedy decisions, it ends up in a jumble loop like that. And of course, it would be much better use of the network resources if we could simply centrally control how flows are carried in the network and arrive at a distribution where traffic flows. Not only the paths are shorter, but you're also traveling uh, I would say like bits per second per mile or something like that. Take, take a unit of resource consumption and you will <coughs> essentially lot better in there. And these are well-known problems, by the way. So this paper was pretty old, but I started working on the SD and stuff 2012 or whatnot. And it just so happened that we didn't have ways to solve them effectively until like SDNs and those kinds of switches kind of came along in there. So that's basically what we tried to do. Uh, essentially, we want to get rid of the efficiency in the van. By the way, like highly efficient van is really trivial, right? Like, you know, we have services that can consume all the network there is. So you, of course, have to couple it with some flexible sharing such that higher priority traffic gets more bandwidth when it needs and so forth. So these two kind of go one in hand in hand because if your goal was 100% utilization, I can tell you it's trivial. You know, just like you can eat up all the CPU on your computer, uh, we can eat up all the bandwidth uh, in a network. And the key design element is, like I said, we're going to coordinate sending rates across services and we are going to do central resource allocation. <coughs> so very simple design, as you might expect, we run a global controller, uh, Swan controller. Uh, we have uh, services, so each of these rack, think of it like a service, we have a thing called service broker that estimates the demand of each service and where it's going. We have this thing called network agents that control the switches, the way they should be programmed. And I'm assuming people kind of know what basic idea behind SDNs that you directly program the switch instead of the switch doing some uh, fancy stuff itself. And these network agents are the one that you know, talk to the switches. And essentially, a very simple optimization, conceptually very simple optimization problem running here. That traffic demand comes in, topology and traffic information go in. And what this one controller decides is bandwidth allocation and network configuration. And based on the bandwidth allocation, there's rate limiting that happens at the host itself. So, so this is basically this is basically what Swan uh, looks like. So, okay, so this is what we wanted to enable. And of course, we ran into, you know, it's, uh, people have not been designing networks and cloud computing infrastructure this way. So there's some challenges we expected along the way and some we did not expect. The challenges we expected were things like scalably computing bandwidth allocation because what we are trying to do is do something of like a max min fare over a network. And it turns out like max min fare of a single resource is trivial, but max min resource on a network is really, really hard because you have to do this iterative water fitting. So things like that we kind of ran into, and I'm not going to talk about those. 
I mean, these things um, in, uh, in, in this talk. And the other expected challenge was uh, commodity switches are limited memory, and you basically want to establish a lot of paths in your network, and each path takes essentially one unit of memory, and that tends to be less as well, so we basically work with limited memory as well, using essentially concepts from operating systems like working set of a process is a lot smaller than the entire memory the process can as well. So we do something similar with switch memory. But the thing that surprised me uh, was this problem of network updates. This was a problem we actually did not anticipate uh, based on just kind of reading up on SDNs and whatnot. Uh, so what is the problem here? The problem is the following. So one thing I actually forgot to mention is that we are running a control loop here that ev in every five minutes takes these inputs and produces an output. So we want to basically reprogram the network every five minutes. So we are reprogramming the global network every five minutes. So think of it like your highway here is just one bundle of resource. Lanes are not divided into north-south. You're just going to dynamically decide with what goes north and what goes south. That's exactly what we're doing, but we're doing it globally and we're doing it every five minutes. So this is just to set some context around why things are happening. Um, okay, so this is the problem that we ran into. The problem is the following. Suppose we wanted to move the state of the network from this one to this one maybe to free up some capacity on the link R2, R4. The problem is that because we cannot change both flows atomically, because the switches, it's a distributed system that we're dealing with, you may end up in one of these two states. One thing I forgot to mention, that the link capacity here, think of it as like 1.5 times uh, the flow. So you cannot, or sorry, one time. So you cannot carry both of those. So what will happen is that if flow FB moves first, you'll see congestion on this link, and if flow <coughs> If A moves first, so one of the flows will move first, right? So you're trying, to, there's no way to avoid that easily, at least, unless you have like, like perfectly synchronized clocks. And we can talk about why those are easy or hard, but assume that you don't have those. Um, why and, that, sorry? Why, why is that a problem? I mean, couldn't you just set up both routes and set up both routes and then just, just except, for the, except for the first fork and then just change the direction the traffic is? No, but the direction needs to be changed at two different places, right? So one, one of those would change the direction first. So, so going from here to here, so R2 needs to be told, stop sending FB downwards, and R1 needs to be told, <coughs> stop R2, sending FB upwards. R, you know, R2 doesn't need to be told, only R1 needs to be told. Uh, why does R, R2 needs to be told about the green flow, not the blue one. Oh, this is two flow, two yes. flow updates? Yes. So both flows are changing mm -hmm. paths. So at the very least, you tell the both sources to change direction. Are you, are you just <coughs> trying to complicate it by doing them both simultaneously? Uh, oh, no, you, oh, no, you, no you this is what we need to oh, do. Oh, you, you say you're, you're batching all your updates and doing them simultaneously. That's, that's the source of the problem. Um, yeah. <coughs> so every every five minutes or so, we need to change how traffic flows through the network. Sorry, then, Chris, what is yeah. What's the rationale for five minutes as opposed to oh. five minutes or two minutes? Um, um, I think we'd like to go as fast as we can. So we did some data analysis, and what we found was that if we change the five-minute interval to 10 minutes, we lose about 2 to 3% of utilization. So the traffic is bursty. So the way, the, and I'll show some results. So we can fully use the network, and what we find is that the faster we go, the better. Uh, we have not been able to evaluate, given how the data, real data, is collected at five-minute granularity. So what I don't know is that if we started driving the system at two minutes, will it go fast? Will it go better? But we do know that. If you go 10 minutes, uh, we do something here. Yeah. Question? But yeah. every time you change a the flow, there will be certain packet losses. Uh, that's so, what so we want to avoid. And that's but this is inevitable. Why? Because when you change the path, you may have packets in uh, still uh, in process. You may lose uh, this week has to. Has to uh, you will have reordering, but, <coughs> but losses are not inevitable. I would disagree. Um, I mean, I can, I can. Uh, we've done, we've done. You can, you can take a real switch, steer it. You will see zero loss. I guarantee it. On a single switch, yes. you may be able to do. Yeah. But when yeah. you have multiple switches, if you have to update it in multiple locations, and if you are very careful, if you are, I, I don't know whether you're talking about congestion or you're talking about a different effect. If you're talking about congestion, then I agree with you. If you're talking about a different switch effect, that's part I'm disagreeing with. 
I mean, yeah. he, men what he mentioned yeah. is in flight, when okay, yeah. you're talking yeah. about yeah. milliseconds latency, mm -hmm. in flight mm -hmm. uh, packets will get dropped when you're changing Why? Yeah. Why? No. Why? No. Not if you change, no. Why? Why? change it carefully. Yeah. 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 That, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Congestion, yeah. yes. So the, and the, I talked about how to yeah, address so that. The, the problem is, yeah. the problem you're showing, just to clarify, the problem yeah. you're showing here is not packet loss, it's congestion, right? Yeah. 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 And the problem is that, and the congestion problem, you know, results from the fact that you can't simultaneously exactly. update, multiple, update multiple flows. So momentarily, right. they, they they congest the same way. Yes. 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 So if okay. you use multipath TCP, does it remove the need for atomic updates? Uh, no. Why not? I mean, I just sent some part of the flow along. I don't know. You instantaneously change the path. The link is congested. How is multipath TCP going to solve that? So you just gradually move the traffic to the other. It doesn't solve it, but it reacts. It should react within. Uh, it'll it'll within react to it will react to losses, right? What is it reacting to? But there shouldn't be uh, the end to end. There shouldn't see any losses. Of the application, of course, you can run <laughs> you can run TCP underneath, and the application will not see any loss. The point is for the packets to not get lost. But the first you gradually thing. shift the traffic from part A to part B. Uh, so you are hinting at essentially the nature of our solution. Yes, you okay. can. And just to clarify, you said that you can deal with packet reordering on the resource. Um, we don't worry about packet reordering. It would be more accurate. We still don't worry. Packet yeah. reordering could result to losses. It could result in few losses. That's true. And then you have to back off and then. Uh, yeah, yeah. But but losses that happen because of congestion are a lot worse. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, um, the MVGCP example is a good one. Right. But you know. Basically, with one packet loss yeah. in an RCT, it should yeah. it should move your start moving traffic. Sorry, say that again. <coughs> I mean, it should react quickly and, and move. Traffic. It should, but the problem here is that these losses are going to be so bursty <coughs> because you suddenly moved you suddenly moved this flow. These losses, depending on the level of oversubscription on the link, these losses are going to be severe and bursty. So that's that's a real danger okay, here. That's, that, like, that's actually a good thing. Yeah. For whom? <laughs> not not for my applications. Uh, they are running large TCP windows, and all of a sudden, you drop like a whole burst of packets. They're going to take time ramping up. It's not good for my network either. Eventually, yes, things will get better. No, it's not eventually. It happens. It starts. It actually starts. Well, okay, we can talk about it later. Okay. It should it should have start happening immediately in one RTT. You lose a lot. Uh, okay, so the idea here is essentially going directly from the initial state to the final state we want to go to. Uh, we go essentially in a few steps. In this example, uh, what we'll do is essentially move half of flow A, assuming this, and we know what the network capacities are. So we move half of flow A, then we move flow B, and then we move other half of flow A. So that's the essentially, essentially the idea. The interesting questions here are around algorithmic, uh, which are around, um, does a plan always exist? And what we can show that if you leave a scratch capacity, let's say 5% on every link, there's always an update plan that exists uh, within 1 over S, where S is a scratch capacity. So if your scratch capacity is 10%, there's at least like a nine step process always exists. What we can also do actually, empirically we can find a plan with a minimum number of steps. And what we find in reality is you can always find something within two to three steps. So what's happening here is that we're leaving let's say five or 10% of the capacity only to facilitate moves. So that's the kind of like the idea, and there's some algorithmic stuff, I'm not gonna go into the details, but you gotta get the idea, think about like two glasses of water with red and blue liquid that you wanna flip. If you left some space in each glass, you can just flip them in 10 steps. That's exact, that's basically what we're doing in the network. Yeah. What is the definition of a flow? Is it something like IPv4 slash 60? Uh, no, a flow is uh, switch to switch aggregated traffic. Uh, and what is the aggregation when you have the matching conditions? All traffic going, all traffic going across a tunnel. Uh, so starting, let's say, a switch in New York, ending up in a switch in Seattle. Mm -hmm. All TCP flows that are taking that path. Okay. Yeah. So you're using like port number or something to do ECMP? Mm -hmm. uh, no, we do explicit thing. We don't do ECMP. Uh, think of like proper fractional routing in the switch, and we mimic that because switches don't have that support. But just think of like. Um, I mean, our traffic engineering solution would produce send 50% here, 70% here, and get back. Okay, uh, the other thing is like, now you might wonder, because I was making such a big deal out of losing, like to Nick's answer, 5% capacity, now I've left essentially 5% vacant all over. Uh, the beauty of this is that we don't have to actually leave those vacant, because what we can do is essentially fill it out with background traffic. So what we can do is protect our hyper IT traffic from congestion, 
provably, and then we can essentially bound the amount of congestion for background traffic that can exist in the network. And you can use the same solutions for both things. And now we're using the network again fully, except with the guarantee that high priority is protected. So these are the numbers, these are the results we see, essentially with, um, this is real data, uh, our real network. If what would happen, so one shot here essentially means that you are not being careful with your updates. You just send them all at the same time. And what you see is that some of the links get oversubscribed by a huge number. So this would be heavy duty over congestion. And if you want to estimate the amount of extra data that would arrive at the link, it can run into hundreds of megabytes. Now, if your switch has a 10 megabyte buffer, what you will see is essentially a burst of drops of this much data. I mean, it, the actual losses would be less if TCP backs up in enough time, but this gets to the idea that there'll be severe congestion. But two things I want to say here. One is that the line missing here is for Swan with non-background traffic, because, and it's missing because that's provably zero, and we see that in the experiments. That's just the uh, analytical result as well. And this line suddenly drops at 10% is because we programmed it such that the boundary congestion on the background traffic should not be more than 10%. So it gets bounded at 10% here. And what the interesting thing is that for high priority traffic, which is non-background, if you do one-shot updates, even your high priority traffic suffers. So we have priority queuing in the switch. Despite that, high priority traffic will suffer if you do just simply one-shot updates. But I'm confused yeah. a bit by this graph because it doesn't seem like their integral is one for this CD. Uh, I mean, in the sense of uh, yeah, can you talk? So, I'm sorry, can you talk about what yeah. it like? So oh, by blue and red, like we start <coughs> seeing below sub one percent of the over subscription ratio of zero. So we're yeah, yeah. Um, so here's what's happening in this experiment. Um, I think so. Take a week long trace. We every five minutes change the network, and based on the change of the network, you can simulate if you did the updates one shot. Uh, how much will the link get over subscribed? <coughs> So even this is not going 100% because they are basically 90% of the cases where even if you did it one shot, nothing bad happens. But there are all these other cases here, around 0.1% of the cases, you'll essentially see a heavy oversubscription. So this is 0.1% of the updates? 0.1% of the updates. So multiply that by every five minutes and you get a sense of like how bad things can be. So Okay, yeah, so, so this one is uh, the amount of extra traffic that you're actually dropping within the network, right? Uh, well, drops depend on the buffer capacity, so this is a kind of rough estimate of that. Okay, so how does this actually impact application performance? Um, depends on the application. If it's interactive traffic, um, performance will suffer. <laughs> so some of the high priority traffic is interactive traffic, and that happens like, as an example, if the user goes to our data center in Seattle, not all the index is replicated, so we need to do an index lookup in some other data center, if that packet gets dropped, then essentially the user, the underlying application will recover, but essentially the end result would that be your query response time will go up. So do you have like some quantitative estimates of how much it will go up if you, you know, do this one shot versus one? And uh, it will at least increase it by one RTT, unless you are doing FEC over <coughs> the data. For every query? So what? For every query? Uh, for, the, for the packet of the query that got dropped. So yes. are, are, the, are the updates themselves done uh, just sequentially as quickly as possible, or are they? In, is there any kind of time synchronization present? Uh, in, in this model, because they are multiple steps, what we do is send out all the updates corresponding to one step, wait, wait for it to finish. Uh, but I'll describe actually what we really are building now later. This is so. Think of this is a perfect switch model right now. Yeah. I think switch, I'll get to the ugliness that switch is introduced in a bit. I still don't understand what this is saying. Like, extra traffic where for the whole network? Uh, at the link. At, at the link. At which link? At some, this is a CDF. So these are the links that get oversubscribed. Okay. Can I talk about it offline? <laughs> okay. It's just, it's just really cryptic. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'm probably not the other person who's yeah. lost. So. Okay, what's the, okay, is everybody lost? Yeah. Okay, I guess <laughs> it's a statistic okay. calculated over all congested links. It is over, so the CDF is over um, all links and all time instances. Yes, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Quick question, yeah. what is a typical update size? Uh, it, varies, it varies by switch, but anywhere between 50 to 100 routes need to be changed on switch. <coughs> 
So one question, you said um, the number of steps is bounded by 1 over s minus 1, right? So 10% would be 100 by 10 minus 1, 9, right? But then you said typically you observe this 1 over 2. So why? Yeah. What, what uh, because we can, we can, so that's a worst case bound. We have an algorithm to find a plan that is uh, faster than the worst case bound. So is that across any type of, um, like if it's 10% versus 5%, it's still 1 over 2? Uh, the one or two is an empirical result okay. with real data and real traffic characteristics. Okay. But yeah. with different rates of oversubscription? Sorry, what do you mean by different rates of oversubscription? So if it's 10% versus 20%, you're saying in typical real world you're able to get 10 in like two steps? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so this is just a result. What we're doing is we're taking the real data and we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. Right? So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing it to the real world. Okay. So we're comparing Essentially, we hit about 97 or 98 percent of optimal uh, if it's one. The interesting thing, and this is what you hit today. So MPLST is the world today, and if you do a best case analysis of that, it'll be about 60 percent. What's kind of interesting here is that uh, this middle ground essentially represents ISPs today that are not able to do rate control over the network. So you know, at Microsoft, when we talk about interdc WAN, we control the servers and we can do rate limiting, but somebody like AT&T is not able to do rate limiting. So this result captures that if you simply were to reconfigure your network, no rate control at the edges, simply reconfigure your network quickly to match traffic demand, how much better can you do with respect to your network utilization? So we are basically trying to increase the traffic matrix while, while keeping its spatial integrity alive, and how much more can we carry here? So what you see is that the gain is basically, one way to look at it is that, yes, ISPs will also benefit from doing this WAN TE, but the other way to get like all the gain of Swan, half of it comes from our ability to quickly reconfigure the network, and the other half comes from our ability to time shift uh, traffic. Yeah. When you say rate control, do you really mean the end, end application yeah. or the or some traffic shaper in front of the no and end, end host. And, and yeah, we have token buckets all the way to the host. And can you? get similar red control by using some device in front of the applications if you don't have control maybe, applications? But maybe, maybe. It's just, so it's just easier for us to we control the hypervisor. It's just easier to put the token bucket there rather than some other device. Because what, what, what a token bucket sitting on the host lets us do is to push back onto the app. If you put a device in the network that's shaping it, that will lead to losses. So there's some advantages. I mean, just, yeah. yeah. The reason right. I ask is because if you don't have control over the applications, uh, yeah. what can you do? Uh, we, we slide a, a token bucket in the hypervisor. Okay. So that's exactly how we are building it out right now. And actually. if you don't have control over the hypervisor, device, but you have a physical network device, yeah. can you do something similar? Um, yeah, you can. I think the, the important thing is, like, do you or do you not want to tell the application that it's rate limited? And to us, it seems important. If a, if a shaping happens in the middle of the network, that generally does more damage than shaping that happens on the host itself. Right, but, yeah. Yeah. but this is the solution to the ISP problem because they don't, they can't reach it to the hypervisor. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, one quick question: yeah. What granularity are you doing for example? Uh, it per or is it per application? It is per service. Per service. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so quick things on like where we are. So we are. Um, so I don't know if you read, guys have read the B4 paper. This slide is interesting only if you read the B4 paper. But I want to say like the way we are migrating our existing network to Swan is by essentially stealing capacity from the wide area network at existence today. So 10 gigs at a time, instead of attaching it to our traditional routers, we attach it here. So we are basically, in essence, while the fibers are kind of shared, we are in essence running two parallel networks, one using MPLS that talks to our traditional routers, and one using these Swan switches and whatnot. And over time, we're going to keep stealing capacity till we essentially end up at a point here. And that's the kind of the path we're on right now. And we're somewhere in this, in here. All right. So um, that was basically so on. So this stuff is happening, and we've been kind of working along and looking at more things. So going back to the theme of the talk, uh, which is the challenge of data plane updates in SDN. Can uh, I ask yeah. one more question yeah. about the previous section? Yeah. So what, what do you do uh, in terms of network resiliency? When there's a network failure, you're close to 100% utilization. Mm -hmm. Does it burn and crash and burn, or what? Uh, does it crash and burn? Um, so we have priority queuing in the switches. So first of all, discovering failures. So we actually run distributed routing protocols to discover topology failures. Uh, after topology failure, uh, actually, put that question on the stack. I'll, I'll give you a better answer. Uh, but I think we are no worse than others, uh, as it works today. Given that high priority traffic tends to be about uh, anywhere between 10 to 40% of overall traffic, 
that puts you in the same regime roughly as the overutilized over provisioning today. So even if we did nothing, we would be no worse when capacity loss happens. So you're uh, preempting all the background traffic. Basically. Yeah, yeah. So that okay. just the switch priority queuing will take care of that. Okay. It will, yeah. Uh, but we, I'll tell you like why we actually do something even better. Uh, in a bit. Uh, okay. So the data plane update problem. I think once we kind of, it's because it surprised us. We kind of started thinking more about it. One thing you quickly realize it's not just about congestion. The problem and the space of it is much richer than just congestion. Uh, we can talk about like packets and black hole while changing the network state. They can loop. And there's this also this property that we're calling packet coherence, which is basically saying that if you have rule, open flow rules or switch rules in the path of the network, any packet that goes to the network should see either the old set of rules or the new set of rules, but never mix up the two. So that's packet <coughs> coherence. And that's basically a security related property when you care about it, not resource related. So just a quick example to give you intuition why some of the other problems can arise. So take a simple example of loops. Uh, again, you want to go from this routing in your network to this routing. Let's say all packets go into destination B. Now, if you ended up updating, I think in this case, X before Y, you, your packets will essentially loop in the network. So you can now see intuitively like why packet coherence and backwards and things like that can also happen. So, so basically, I think there's a, there's a range of consistency properties here that you might want in network. Not every property makes sense for every network. But some network or the other, depending on the type of traffic and the type of network, you may care about not having black holes, not having loops, not having congestion, or having packet coherence, things like that. The other thing we found was, and when we started measuring real hardware, uh, that the real world is even messier. Uh, it's messy because switches actually take time to update the rules. So that's going to elongate the mismatch that happens uh, for the duration. So this is, this is data that Google reported. On there. So by the way, so this data actually Google also reports that one percent of the attempted updates to the switch actually fail. Um, and but but those that don't fail, this is the amount of time they take. So we're talking about time in seconds. And this time is happening. Part of it is RPC delay, just going to the switch and talking to the software. And part of it is actually the remaining part is the time it takes for the rule update to happen on the switch. So this is a real wide kind of complex network. And this is what the situation looks like in a really clean sanitary setting of a lab where there's no basically RPC delay. The interesting thing for us was like, you're basically hitting numbers like, you know, this is a 100 millisecond number per rule. If you have 100 rules to update, it'll take you a second uh, sometimes in there, yeah. Uh, the updates to the switches, do they happen over the data plane network or do you have separate control plane network? Uh, we don't have a separate control plane network, but we do priority queuing again. So these updates go on the, um, on essentially the most preferred path to and the network. Did you have to deal with switch failures and then try to avoid those failures when you're trying to control the network? Switches fail, yeah. Yeah, they fail, but uh, did it happen <laughs> often enough to worry about? Uh, so, um, switch failures happen, but they're not common. The statistic, maybe if you're trying to build an intuition around failures in the network, uh, I think you're asking about what I'm going to call in the future data plane failures, the switch itself failing. What this is, is a control plane delay or control plane failure. So data plane failure, to give you a number, what we see in a larger network, there's one link that fails on average every five minutes. Because that's a network with thousands of links. Uh, so that gives you, essentially, we did some math and like a mean time to failure of like a month or something like that. Yeah. So back off between configurations, if you get a failure and you have to back out, that makes things very complex. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a problem, good thing. Uh, Great way of putting it. But I think the word, word there is orchestration. How do you orchestrate it back to where it works? Because it may not be saying where you work. Yeah. Yeah. So on, on your experiments, what was the RPC overhead? Uh, this was a machine trying to control basically very little. Because it looks like Google's saying that they have this terrible problem where the RPC itself takes like half a second. This is an end-to-end -end RPC, so they have some software running on the switch. It's being filtered through both the controller and the switch software. So yeah. I think ours was a clean environment. We were some software so, sitting on the switch. I guess the point is that even if the rule update do drops to zero, you still may have this horrible yeah. RPC. Yeah. Problem, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think some of the failures they are seeing are basically kind of software complexity related RPC failures. But my kind of personal belief, I think, is like, yes, switches will get better over time. But given that you're talking about a large, complicated system and updating hundreds or thousands of switches, you will continue to see these effects of delays and failures and whatnot. And so, so then the attempt would be to actually solve them. Um, rather than just wait for the future. 
Uh, so okay. So once all of this is happening, update problems are generic to SDNs. Uh, they happen in a lot of different ways. And I think to my mind, it raises a lot of questions, some kind of theoretical and fundamental and some practical. And the fundamental questions become like, just like data consistency has a range, like you know, you could be eventually consistent or you could be strongly consistent or last writer and things like that. I think we're talking about now networks in the same way. That there are a lot of consistency properties, some relevant to some networks, some relevant to some other networks. So it's a fundamental issue, what consistency properties can be actually maintained and how? And is there some relationship between the strength of the property? We don't still know how to put them on an axis of strength, but just intuitively, you know, congestion freedom is harder than loops, as an example of strength. And the ease of maintenance. And there are practical issues which are simple. How do you quickly and safely update the data plane? And I want to stress quickly, because it, does, it, it took us a while to realize why speed is important. Speed is important because when you, oftentimes you're changing the data plane state in response to failures. And failures have congestion, so you want to basically update the state as fast as possible. But it also has impact on network utilization, because if some link is congested and you're trying to fix the utilization problem, uh, and it also has impact on flow response time. Again, basically, you're changing the data plane state to resolve congestion, to deal with failures, or to eliminate some hard spot. And the longer you take to update, the more damaging it can be in there. So the rest of the talk, even though I don't have enough time, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Uh, is around these issues, and these are very early takes. I think these are early, day, early days for data plane update problems in SDN. So this was kind of kind of one attempt to make sense of the space a little bit. Um, on the on this axis across rows are various consistency properties. You may have eventual consistency basically amounts to no consistency, just like in the database world. Uh, eventually things will get better, right? Because switches will update themselves. And congestion freedom is what I talked about. Black hole freedom, no black holes, no loops, and packet coherence is what I described about mix of old and rules. On the y-axis is a measure of how hard it is to update the network. And this is a measure of dependency among switches. So one thing you realize is that these updates are hard is because to do them consistently, there's a relationship between when it's a, one switch can move and when, key, when the other can move. So for example, in the case of loops, what happens is that you know your downstream packets where you're sending switches, their flow tables should be updated before upstream routers can start sending packets to them. So this whole data plane update problem is basically around dependencies in there. So we try to capture the strength based on that, how dependent the mesh is. So congestion freedom, which I call calling a staged partial moves, is basically has global dependencies because it's a link resource thing, a switch can move when a switch can move safely depends on all other switches in the network. So it's very complex. Something as simple as black hole freedom you can get by simply making sure that the new rule is present in the switch before you delete the old one. So make sure the packet will never actually go to dev null because there's a rule that exists. So it basically has a dependency only on itself. And some things like loops have, depending on the algorithm you use, have dependencies on downstream subset of routers or all are downstream routers. So a couple interesting things here. One is that we can prove that this space is impossible. And there are kind of results in here. That basically you cannot have congestion freedom in where their dependency is not there. <coughs> you cannot have loop freedom where the dependency is only on the router itself. So you have to create these chains and whatnot. And the other interesting thing is like, I think there are two impressions you might, one is that, so we say the problem is not solved because these are highly qualitative measures of the ease of maintenance. So I think there's more detailed work here to be done to actually establish more quantitative sense of what's the best known solutions possible uh, in this world. And the other thing is like this is not counting for memory limits in the switches. If I put in memory limits as a constraint on the switch, all of these entries will move here, basically. So this is assuming. So the, this kind of making the world look rosy, it's actually a little bit more complex than that in there. So quick question. I'm confused about the yeah. x-axis Yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems like global dependency sort of like captures like everything else yeah right? yeah uh, so why is there like why are there like some properties which are maintained with dependencies global this seems more complicated than just having like a downstream subset of self uh, so 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 repeat the question please okay so global uh, dependency yeah it seems to be more complex than yeah. downstream subset because yeah. you're just worried yeah. about a subset of switch yeah. updates yeah. right yeah so why are some properties for example yeah. condition freedom yeah. possible in the more complicated settings like global than you know in less complicated settings because Seems it's a complex. more complicated where the dependencies get created so what's missing here is that there's nothing between so what this is saying is that to maintain congestion freedom 
you will depend on switches that are not along the downstream path of a flow. You will actually depend on some other switches in the network as well. And that happens because you're talking about link congestion. There could be some random switch in the network sending traffic on this link, and you're waiting on that switch to take its traffic away before you can put traffic on it. So, so you have to read to resolve the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So what the depend yeah, so so think of it like, you know, think of it from a so this table may be better understood from a switch's perspective. When can I install new routes? Who do I depend on before I can install new routes? So if you want congestion freedom, you could depend on anybody in the network because anybody in the network could be sending traffic on the link that you rely on to congestion to not happen. But if you are only care about loops, you only depend on your downstream people because as long as their flow tables are updated to the new rules, you're okay. You can update yes, yours. Yeah. But I'm asking like, why is uh, congestion freedom yeah. impossible if I only depend on uh, downstream subset of switches? Uh, that's because the traffic on the link could be coming from any switch in the network, not just those that are downstream of you. There's a link in the middle, you know, between CL and Wyoming. Anybody could be sending traffic on it. That's why. But so I'm not sure we can yeah. get into this, and so feel yeah. free to, yeah. to pull me off. But what kind of, these sorts of dependencies that you have in the operations you want to perform mm -hmm. on the network, what kind of consistency requirements does that place on the underlying network? Like, I want to insert these flow table entries, yeah. and I need something about their ordering, their timing, whether they've been active in the network. Like, so the, I want to change the network, but yeah. then at some point it has to hit hardware. And given those latency numbers you shared, yeah. Yeah. I'd be worried. Um, so I think this is kind of like a theoretical view of the world where once you send a command to the switch, so I think the dependency here would be that think of each dependency edge as having a barrier command in between. Right? So if you wanted to implement just these exact algorithms, you will do barrier. Uh, but you can, of course, like if you loosen these things, you can go faster. Right? Yeah. But this was just to kind of make sense of what the space is like. <coughs> okay, so I have 10 minutes and I have two more things to describe, but I'm going to cut them short now. Um, so, okay, so going back, going back from, I think, that uh, kind of fundamental domain to kind of practical domain, here's what we've been building for the last uh, couple months. Um, by the way, so maybe uh, the animation was useful. A typical SDN pipeline looks like this. You have some network state, you have some policy that computes the new state of the network, the target network state, and then you have like an update planner that applies that state to the network based on the consistency property you want to maintain. So in Swan, we have the Swan controller, computes like how the traffic should flow, and then we talked about this multiple stage updates that maintain congestion freedom and applies it to the network. So this is what it looks like today. We are doing two things to this pipeline. One is that uh, we are uh, my PowerPoint has crashed now, so you're going to laugh at me because I won't get Microsoft. So one of this is what we are calling like forward fault correction. So this is a way to proactively uh, handle failures. So such that even if K faults, K update failures happen in the network, no congestion will happen. So the analogy here is to forward error correction, where you add redundancy in your packet stream such that few packets can get dropped and nothing bad will happen. So in forward fault correction, we are computing traffic spreads in the network such that some links could fail or some switches could fail to update and yet no congestion will happen. And the second thing, now I need to up. Uh, sorry guys. <laughs> Why you were good, so yeah. that's going to take a couple minutes. Um, so what about feedback? Yeah. Don't you want to get feedback into this, some diagnostic, so you know, you know what's happening out there, yeah. despite things you know, that are, yeah. you know, that are going on and yeah. how you're phasing it. And there are many ways to do that. Not only is it passive collection, but you want to be firing like tracers into it to see or think or pass where I think they are, or yeah. beacons where there's delays that, that are happening that are consistent. So I think that, that, so that part comes into this chain that I was going to describe. So what the update planner, planner was going to be like, uh, what we're building is a dynamic scheduler based exactly on that feedback. So currently when people have written these update planners, they have been very static. Say, do this, do this, do this, and no matter what happens in the network, you just follow that chain of sequence. If the middle step uh, essentially takes too long, the whole update gets expanded. So we're essentially building dynamic scheduling algorithms there, uh, but only if my machine would cooperate.
Do you have the presentation on a USB stick? Uh, no, but I have it in the cloud. <laughs> Do you have PowerPoint down there? Do you have your uh, the other question I had was yeah. how often do you pull each of these switches to get the current state? Five um, minutes is your update time. Is there any empirical way you said, okay, to get the real speed, the current state, I need to do it two minutes, three minutes? Um, I think we do it. Um, I think we've, what we've done, at least for the update business, we've written some software on the switch to give us a reliable acknowledgement when a root has been installed. So we send like an update command to the switch, and the software essentially does polling on the switch itself. In, in terms of what's happening to the utilization, as a result of all these changes, you also want to monitor what the utilizations are, right? I think that, so we plan for something, and there's, there's, there's short-term boostiness, but there's no way to account for that. That's just too fast. Uh, but the overall yeah, planning is, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's my question as well. You know, how do you deal with the short-term burstiness? Because five minutes seems like a really long time. Uh, short-term burstiness is, uh, first of all, we've reduced some of it because of rate limiting. And the other is, uh, it's just like it's dealt today with buffers. Question? Yeah? What you just said. You said that you have some specialized software on the switch mm -hmm. to get reliable feedback. Yeah. Was, is it to, so I assume you're using the barrier, the platform barrier to get feedback. Uh, we are, that we, that we are the not using barrier. And yeah, how is it different? Uh, in other words, is the barrier not enough, or you cannot serve the hardware? Um, once we have software in the switch, it automatically does not send us an acknowledgement of updates having gone through till we get an act back. So, like we're not using the barrier primitive, but the semantics are the same. Once we get the act back, <laughs> that things have gone back into. The actual and, and your software checks the real hardware it actually was installed. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, but but that that is also built on top of some primitives that. Uh, yeah. 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 Because open flow yeah. doesn't really yeah. 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 as many users as right. well. So <coughs> it only guarantees that the configuration is updated, not actually. I mean, not that it, it's been pushed to the actual line card. <coughs> Excellent. <coughs> <laughs> All right, now that I'm out of time. <laughs> not actually out of time. No? Here, keep going. Still can run the thing. Yes. There you go. Or, yeah, let's yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. you, can, you can go until like 115. Uh, okay, so I'll um, I'll basically just give you the essence of these ideas and for, forget the details. Um, okay, so two more parts we're building. One is just robust state generator. That means basically we need to change the state of the network less. So if you don't have to change it. That's the best way of not changing. That's the best way of recovering it. And then it's like a feedback-based planner. Um, so once you get the idea, let me kind of like, this is, this is what I mean, congestion to control plane points. So suppose this is your current state, and you're computing this as your target state. As part of making that transition, you need to update switch S2. Suppose that does not happen. What will happen is it will continue to spread its traffic across 7 and 3. While in the meanwhile, this traffic, the blue traffic has started. So failure to update this switch essentially will lead to congestion in this network. So this is what we're calling a control plane fault. Um, so we get rid of this using this concept that we're calling FFC, forward fault correction. So instead of computing this as the target state, we compute this as the target state. Now you can mentally essentially do the abstract computation here that any one switch's update can fail and the network will not be congested. Any one, so this is the case equal to one. Uh, two things I want to get around, across with the analogy to FEC, that if you wanted the guarantee that two switches can fail, your target state will be different. So now in this case, S2 or S3 could fail. In this case, both S2 and S3 can fail and you would still be okay. So just like FEC, the amount of protection you add, uh, the overhead goes up. 
basically. And or and essentially this thing has it's basically the same thing. If you have intuitions about a FEC, it's exactly the same thing happening here. So that's basically happening. Is so this is FFC for control plane fail false. Does that mean you're actually scheduling less traffic? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And the data plane faults are somewhat similar. That if you actually were computing this and one link fails, you'll essentially this router would start sending traffic on the other link, and this link will get congested. But if instead we had a different traffic distribution, this is robust to any single link failure in the network in there. So our goal is to compute these things. And the problem here is that too, there are too many possible faults in the network. So this is an abstract equation of how you deal with it, basically saying all possible faults of k or less fewer switches, um, and you add all the traffic that will come when a fault happens should be less than the spare capacity. The problem here is that, in, embedded in here, that the number of constraints is basically too high for us to be able to solve it. Uh, I will not go into the details of the solution, but it's based on this idea of sorting networks, where we can construct essentially like this exponential number of constraints into a single constraint uh, by just drilling uh, things. Um, these are, uh, to your question, what overhead we actually see in practice. And these numbers are interesting, I think, for two reasons. One is that, so scale 0.5 here is a scale, is a traffic scale we have. So 0.5 represents essentially what ISPs run today, 50% utilization on average. Scale 1 is what we are running our inter DC WAN at, so fully full network. So what you see is that if you're an ISP, you can essentially, the overhead, the throughput is you can carry all of it. All we are doing is distributing it differently to be more robust. Because there's no hit in the actual throughput ratio of with FFC. But at the same time, we are cutting down the number of losses by 95% or something in there. That's in there. So basically happening. A more interesting case here is this one. This is where the way we run SWAN today, multi-priority traffic. And we can actually have different levels of priority for different things. One thing I forgot to mention is that KC here represents number of switch faults we are willing to tolerate. And KL uh, represents the number of, KD represents the number of data plane faults, leak failures we're willing to tolerate. So we can different levels of protection. And the interesting thing happens here is that, is that our total throughput is very close to total, and but we actually have a huge amount of leverage in data loss. Again, what we've done essentially is played this trick that we have some budget to play with, and we can focus that budget on high priority traffic. And now faults can, ha now three switches can fail to update, and three links can fail to update, and there will be no congestion guaranteed for a high priority traffic. That's the guarantee we've achieved uh, in there. How many priorities are like realistic? We, we run three. Three? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, I think the, the SICOM paper explains why three and what the applications are if you're interested in detail. Um, the second part is about um, computing dynamic schedule. So this is the problem uh, uh, with the static schedulers as they work today. So suppose you wanted to change the state of the network from this one to this one. A multi-step update plan that I described, there are two possible plans, A and B, which basically capture do F3 and F4, so move the changes that are needed for F3 and F4, and once F4 finishes, you can do F1, and once F3 finishes, you can do F2. Similarly, there's an alternative way to move through the network. So trick quotient, which plan is faster? I already gave it away, it's trick quotient, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so depending on the switch that is a straggler, if S2 was having a bad day, this will be fast. Uh, this will be faster. If instead S4 was having a bad day, this will be faster. So it all depends on the switch. So this is the problem with static schedules. If you don't know ahead of time which switch was going to fail to update or which switch was going to take too long to update, you will basically don't know. <coughs> so we are doing essentially this dynamic planning. Uh, basically, we are basically saying this is a dynamic plan where F1 can be triggered as soon as either F4 or F2 finishes. And this would be kind of, in this particular example, is basically the fastest plan possible, uh, irrespective of uh, yes. what switches. You assume that all failures are independent, essentially. Um, um. We don't assume that, because we walk this graph actually dynamically. Yeah. Um, yeah let me just, this is, so this is getting to Yanis's question. Essentially what we do, is take the current state and target state of the network, generate a dependency graph. What this dependency graph captures is all the constraints on the network with respect to consistency. So this should happen before this or this and things like that. We essentially have, so this is like a compact encoding on the exponential number of schedules that you could have. So I'm basically appealing to your computer science intuition at this point. 
the level I'm describing, and then once we have a graph, we have a way to walk this graph based on real-time information. And we have some graph walking algorithms that are very simple, kind of greedy, focus on cycles, and so forth in there. And there are details in the paper. I apologize for rushing through. Uh, but uh, really, these details are straightforward. At a high yeah. level, what, yeah. know, what type of information are you getting in real time? Uh, when an update finished. So it's all about configuration. Yes. It's all so about nothing about the traffic and success yeah. of the traffic. Traffic we already know. Uh, because we are loading the network, we know what how much traffic is happening. Um, so wouldn't that be viable to be back in here as well? That we already have. The, the, the state, the new state itself is being computed based on that. So the thing is like once new state has been computed, how fast can we actually quickly can we do that? And okay. so, quick question. Yeah. So on a real network, how yeah. long uh, does it take to actually stage these updates? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so three three lines here of interest. One shot is basically um, the amount of time it would take if you were to just simply throw up all the networks. Don't do any planning. Uh, and this has, of course, I'll show in the next slide. It has problems related to congestion, and that will come across. These two models are. This is a very optimistic model of the world where the time to update a switch is basically consistently low. But dynamic planners show benefit even in that world because uh, switches, sending too many rules to a switch itself can take time. If you take like 100 rules to a switch, the switch will take some time implementing those 100. So the dynamic planning that we do actually helps even if switches were not stragglers. So this is a model with stragglers. A straggler simply means that we've taken the switch in this simulation, we've taken the amount of time from the distribution that we actually measure. In there. And you see, like basically, we can go a factor of two faster or something, like over uh, what I described the bandwidth. And the end result is essentially uh, we save on congestion. So one shot was really fast, but it essentially leads to a huge amount of oversubscription. So this is the same number that I was having trouble explaining, which is how much extra traffic shows up at a link. So what we see is that if we do one shot, a lot of it, uh, but with Dionysus, Essentially, oversubscription is uh, a factor of like a 40% less than that. In there. And that's basically, so this is why we want to get updates done faster, because we can essentially reduce congestion in the network. One last slide, and then I end, uh, which is, what is the relationship actually? I think in by rush, this thing may have gotten lost here. They actually very, th these are very nicely complementary ideas in the following way. What forward fault correction does is that it basically says a lot of updates don't even need to be done. So you wouldn't even hit this part of the pipeline. But even better, because it's robust, you know, in, in scheduling, it's always the last guy that kills you. You know, that one switch that you could not reach or program. So what, because we are computing these states that are robust to failures of some switches, this planner can actually completely forget about that last two guys. It's basically that's what's happening. Because we compute this robust state, if the results on the previous slide did not capture that effect, but essentially this is what the relationship is. That, you know, forward fault correction says, if last two switches you can program, forget them, and Dionysus will essentially end. And then it will end actually a lot faster than what showed here. So that's essentially the key win here in essentially aligning these things in a pipeline here. Um, all right, uh, so this is our side. Um, Basically, I think what we found through our experience over the last two, two and a half years that SDNs can, in fact, enable new network operating points that were not easy to get to. For our, for our purposes, the starting point was a highly utilized network, a really expensive network that we wanted to use fully. And the use of SDNs essentially let us do that in there. But at the same time, we discovered a lot of interesting problems, and in particular, related to consistently and quickly updating the data plane states. And we've taken essentially some initial steps and trying to understand the space of the problem as well and building practical solutions that both minimize the need for changes as well as compute state itself in a way that is kind of robust through FFC as well as uh, bringing to bear some scheduling algorithms that are cognizant of what's happening in the network rather than with consistent plans. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you. Now I can take it. Yes. So at high level, I mean, you, the numbers you are giving, like current rules, what mm -hmm. the switch take that long, it mm -hmm. sounds very sad. Yeah. That the hardware is not capable of giving yeah. this. Yeah. But eventually it will improve. Yeah. Let's say we have much better hardware, yeah. we can take tens of thousands. I'm just picking up yes. the number. And but <coughs> how is it going to affect uh, all of this? 
Um, I think um, two things. I think one is that it's not just about the switch. If you're operating a network with thousands of switches, there are other things in that critical path of trying to update the switch that are really hard to just get right 100% of the time. So even if, you know, 0.1% of the time, uh, some switch essentially barfs or your communication with some switch barfs, even a thousand switch network, basically every update will have some switch essentially giving you trouble. So I think that's kind of like the perspective we are taking. Yes, the hardware will get better. So the normal numbers I was showing is with, it basically had kind of no switch uh, problems. But I think we're saying that we are operating essentially data centers and networks with tens of thousands of switches. We really need something robust on top rather than relying on underlying hardware and underlying systems being perfectly robust. So that's kind of the word. That's our, I think hardware will get better, it will help us. These numbers will start getting better, but the relative win I think will stay. Yeah. So following up a bit on that, uh, yeah. you know, like there are certainly real switches where you know you update something and uh, and it's sure it's updated its configuration, but it hasn't necessarily propagated yeah. all the way down to yeah. you know the, the last line card. And so I guess I have sort of two questions. You know, one yeah. is one is how does this affect how does this affect it, and two is does the forward fault correction help you out in that case? Uh, forward fault correction definitely helps us out in that case. Um, but but I have two part answer. I think forward fault correction those silent failures. It's completely agnostic to or yes, they can happen and this will do the right thing. Yeah, it's sort of uh, a, sort yeah. of a you know, random delay. Yeah. Is essentially. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So we treat essentially excessive delay as basically a failure to update. And excessive delay could be silent or not silent. Uh, <coughs> FMC does not care. But to answer your previous question, I think the world is, if you, at least our experiments are showing, the world is not that bad because if you can write some piece of software on the switch, uh, essentially we wrote that. Uh, on top of uh, two vendors, uh, where we found that we can essentially generate an act when the update has been pushed down into the line card. So there are all these like low-level switch APIs available that are underneath OpenFlow, which we are using, and we don't. I think they tell us use these APIs, and then we test them. That usually when you get an act from them, so we are looking a layer below. If we were working purely at OpenFlow layer. Uh, I think things will look a lot worse than they do for us right now. But I think we, we realized early on that given the state of open flow implementations, that's not a layer we could build a system out of. Uh, so we just run our own software on the switches. But abstractly, it's doing the same thing. It's just more kind of, it, does, it lies to you less. I think hardware lies all the time. It's just a matter of how much. <laughs> so, yeah. I have a question here. Yeah. Um, how do the middle boxes affect your experiment? Um, what mailboxes? Load balancers, firewall, intrusion prevention systems. Um, I'm trying to understand your question actually. Um, In your paper, you allude yeah. to the middle boxes such as load balancers. Yeah. And you say if load balancers were present, present in the infrastructure, then this algorithm may behave different. Um, That's the impression I, I carry. I don't remember writing that line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Meaning your, uh, something about the load balancing. I think oh. any, any automatic intelligence, uh, this is, has to be accounted for. Uh, the point is, can you build kind of high fidelity models of the underlying intelligence? If you can, um, then I think they are easy to account for. If you can't, um, kind of bets are off. Um, so I think the kinds of intelligence we count for, I think we are leaving it up to the switches to, um, to migrate. When, once a tunnel fails, there's an automatic algorithm in there to migrate traffic to the remaining tunnels. So that kind of intelligent behavior, we can program into the FFC equations themselves to compute the robustness and things like that. Uh, the other kinds of uh, ECMP, we can also model. So it's only a matter of, I think, what intelligence and what automatic actions we understand. And the simple ones we can model, and I think those are the only ones that exist in our network today. At least when it comes to, I think at above, you know, there's an application layer three happening in the network. Uh, above that, a lot of stuff happens, but if you look below that, um, it's a it's a simple network with very simple things like uh, failovers and, and load balancing. Yeah. So correct me yeah. yeah. if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, the second question I had was in your paper, you talk about updating, say, a hundred switch network. Yeah. And you say the problem is the delay. Yeah. And once the delay is so large that update kind of gets distorted yeah. from what you plan, yeah. the whole process fails. Yeah. You also allude somewhere that you don't like partial updates. 
be especially when you are referring to an algorithm yeah. uh, in which you say there is a strong coupling between the, the elements and that partial updates is also prob problematic and you in fact propose at the end of your paper at least that paper which I the only it. one I read okay uh, you talk about um, algorithms yeah. which will essentially look at the attributes of the network and based on that you propose that there is an opportunity to write those algorithms which will um, allow you to update the network, the, the switches, mm -hmm. more uh, efficient. Yeah. That's the crux of your... So, what, so just so I have context, which paper is this? Uh, this, is, <laughs> yeah, this is... I couldn't get to your papers, so only okay. one I could see. So, so a lot of, uh, I think two or three papers, they are yet to be released. I see, I see. So I'm really curious if things are leaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the work I described, I think the SICOM paper from last year, so the main SWAN paper and the table paper are public. This is not uh, from the SWAN paper, uh, this is from the other paper. FFC? Uh, which is for the, the Zurich, is another author So from this is Zurich. the Hartnett paper? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay, good, yeah. okay, yeah, 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 okay. So now tell me about that paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, um, I, think Jalaj, I think, yes, we worry about partial updates. Um, and I think when we are building these things out, we are essentially will roll back our partial update. But the point yeah, I was yeah. making, you're essentially at the end saying that this is a, basically a problem of entire computer science, yeah. of distributed computing to do the updates yeah. in a very, very efficient manner. I agree. Would it work? Um, That's the question I wanted to it, ask. It depends on the property you want. Um, I think for simple property, just like, so think about it, I think, so I never understood, you know, when people like Nick and others, like SDN is going to make a, a networking problem into a distributed systems problem. So it's a nice sounding line, right? Um, and I never understood it until I started doing this. And yes, it has, I think there are lots of patterns. Um, so to draw an analogy, in the database world, there are lots, so many consistency models. They each have a different cost. Some are achievable in practice, some are not. This is a similar world. So I think we know at least the ones we listed, I know how to achieve them and at what cost. So loops, black holes, congestion, freedom, packet coherence. But you can come up with fancier properties. Maintain, so a simple thing I don't know how to do. Maintain coherence and congestion freedom in a non-tunnel network. It's a computation, comp I can write down the equations, but it's too complex that you won't want to solve it directly. So, but the thing is like, I haven't encountered a network like that yet. So I haven't paid too much attention. So I think there'll be limits. Uh, just like in the database world, there are limits to what kinds of consistency properties you can. In the end, you fight the speed of light and things like that. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Yeah, Terrence, I ask about the packet coherence. So you, you implement packet coherence in the network using the version numbers or tunneling? Or? Uh, we have tunnels, so we get packet coherence for free. So yeah. you, you will set up alternative tunnels and then you'll just move over to that tunnel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.